Hey everyone, good to see you here. Brett Loth with Logos Vertas here to uh, to talk to you for a little bit tonight. Uh, tonight for me, maybe not for you, but here to talk to you about a few things that I just wanted to get in touch with you guys uh, and share with you, kind of see what you guys think, uh, but share with you something that's been on on my heart here for a little while and um, taking a look first off with if you've ever heard the hymn It Is Well by Horatio G. Spafford we're going to talk about that first if you haven't pause just a second and go listen to the hymn um, it's really good Okay, I know sometimes people aren't really into hymns today but this one's, act this one's really good so t pause real quick go check it out and then we'll get started. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started. I'm gonna assume that you paused and, and went and, and checked it out. So, It Is Well by Horatio G. Spafford. It, uh, I was, I grew up listening to parts of the backstory of this hymn and started taking a look at it again here. Mm couple months ago and I mean this guy Horatio G. Spafford he went through some stuff now um, he his son uh, in all right so this is in 1871 it's been a while right his his son his four-year-old son okay I got a I've got a, a young son his son who's four years old dies of scarlet fever in 1871 um, two years pass by after his son dies he's got four daughters and his wife and they're going to go uh, on a family vacation in England where one of his friends uh, D.L. Moody for those of you who know anything about um, the American minister uh, D.L. Moody uh, Horatio G. Spafford was friends with him. So his family is going to go out on vacation and meet up with with their friend there, uh, D.L. Moody, who is preaching in England. On the way cr uh, crossing the, the Atlantic on a ship, I'm not even going to try and pronounce it, it's in French, I'm really bad at French, I'm not going to butcher it. Um, anyway, the ship that they're on gets struck by another another ship and it kills 200 and 26 people including all four of Spafford's daughters his wife Anna is the only survivor from was the only survivor from their family uh, in that tragedy she's she sends him a telegram right he sent them ahead uh, he had some some business related stuff that had kept him from going with them at that time and she sends him a telegram that says um, it just reads saved alone so he's on his way sailing to join his wife and uh, about the point where they get to uh, where they believe the ship went down at the uh, one of the ship the guys who worked on the ship came and got him said this is about as best we could figure this is where the ship that was carrying your wife and your daughters went down so he goes out on the deck and uh, I mean, I, I mean, I don't, I, I wasn't there. I can't tell you exactly what he did. I'm, I'm putting myself in his shoes, thinking there would be some serious soul searching going on. I, I would be crying out to God, wanting to know, you know, do you have my girls? Or, you know, how am I going to get through this, God? It's my wife and I. Um, I don't understand why this is going on. While he's in the midst of this of this time, it's like as he's on the trip over to go join his wife, the loss of his four daughters is fresh in his mind. Right, he lost his son. He lost his son two years earlier. He writes the song uh, "It Is Well with My Soul." All right, so listen to just some of these lines here. Okay. 
said, when peace like a river attendeth my way. Mm, that sounds nice. Peace. Who doesn't like peace? When peace like a river attendeth my way. And then the, the tone shifts. When sorrows like sea billows roll. Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. He's not a sadist or a masochist here. He is not enjoying this pain. But because of who Spafford trusts in, or he trusts in the Lord, because of who he trusts in, because he knows of the goodness of the Lord, He's able to say, okay, Lord, even though I don't understand, even though I don't know why I think, why this is going on, I trust you. I know that you're watching over me. You're watching over my family. You've, you're still watching over my kids. And even though I don't quite understand why this has happened, I'm going to trust you because I, I know that you care about me, that you love me that you were faithful right he continues with the it is well it is well with my soul uh, through the chorus though Satan should buffet though trial should come let this blessed assurance control that Christ hath regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul so even though Satan comes against Jake even though you know, life is going to throw stuff at you that is going to make you question sometimes, you know, is everything really going to be okay? Does God really have my back? He said, let, let this assurance, this heavenly assurance, keep you. That not only has Jesus seen you, and he, not only is he aware of you, but he shed his blood for you. He got personally involved with where you are. And he wants a relationship with you. He hasn't just looked at you from way far off. And uh, the hymn's not real long. But it is, man, there is some, some serious stuff in here about being able to trust the Lord. Being able to look at his, look at the word, um, look at the Bible. And... Being able to apply that to life. It's not just a hollow, you know, wooden text that doesn't have anything to say for today. It's truth to live by. Um, recently, I was, I was listening to the podcast for uh, the radio show Unbelievable with Justin Brierly. Uh, if you guys, if you guys are interested in hearing conversations about faith and reasons to believe and different uh, different lines of belief for people who <clears throat> they interview people who do and don't hold Christian viewpoints and they'll take an issue take two different sides of the issue and have people debate or not really debate they have conversations about about uh, things and generally um, they're they're very productive they're very they're done very gracefully uh, and that was the case with a recent one about uh, from unbelievable it was deconstruction doubt and finding faith again with Lisa Gunger and Elisa Childers uh, if, if any either of those names sound familiar to you uh, Lisa Gunger and her husband Michael had come out on social media here not long Ago and had said uh, Michael Gunger had come out saying that he um, was identifying as an atheist. She says she did for a period of about 24 hours, but um, begins to identify as something not atheist. She says that she's definitely a Christian, but more progressive, not quite a traditional Christian. Uh, Elisa Childers is from the band Zoe Girl that was popular back in the 90s um, so if you know that band you're probably dating yourself a little bit uh, and for a while she struggled with uh, wondering if 
if Christianity was all it was cracked up to be. Uh, when she got into a church that the pastor said that he was basically a hopeful agnostic and began deconstructing uh, deconstructing things in, in the faith um, and really kind of threw what she was used to, what she had grown up uh, hearing and, and took her into a place of doubt and uncertainty. So she, uh, they had a conversation here and talking about uh, deconstructing your faith and the importance of knowing why you believe what you believe, not just, you know, drinking the Kool-Aid, so to speak, and, and everything. Uh, and Elisa Childers works for RZIM, Robbie Zacharias International Ministries, um, also an awesome podcast, uh, an awesome ministry going on there. They've got several podcasts going on that I thoroughly recommend. Uh, one thing that came out in the course of the discussion that I'd like to zero in on, though, uh, was where um, af after several times uh, where... Lisa Gunger was talking about that she's definitely a Christian. She definitely believes in in Jesus. Uh, she's a follower of Jesus. And so she identifies as a Christian. And when she was kind of pressed as to, like, what does that mean? Uh, at one point, Lisa Childers asks uh, from John 14, 6, she asks, well, what about like where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Um, do you believe that the only way to God is through Jesus? And to, to paraphrase the conversation, Lisa Gunger did not agree with that. Said that there's a lot of different, different uh, streams you can take to get to the same well. It all comes out in the wash, more or less, and that she didn't believe that. She didn't believe that Jesus was born of a virgin, that he died on the cross for our sin, that he died and atoned, died as atonement for our sin, it doesn't believe that he resurrected from the dead, um, basically believes that he was a nice guy and taught some, some moral things. Um, but evidently must be a, a legend, a liar, or a lunatic. Um, she didn't say that, but that doesn't leave you with many other things where that you can label Jesus as when he makes statements like that that the the Jews were ready to to kill him for on a few on a few occasions like where his before Abraham was I am, um, and of course it ended up coming out that well you know, of course Jesus is a son of God you know and we're all sons and daughters of God so there's there's a difference there. Um, he is so in a unique sort of way that that we simply are not. Um, pretty much denied any of the all of the the traditional you know we, everything that we would hold to as a Christian that what C.S. Lewis is, it would label it with mere Christianity and talking about there are certain beliefs that Christians hold across the board, whether you're, whether you're Catholic, whether you're Protestant, non-denominational, whatever, that you are, uh, that if you're Christian, you're going to hold to just basic Christianity. And progressive Christianity seems to be taking more of a fair weather faith approach where yeah, we like where he talks about helping the poor and and uh, you know turn the other cheek and everything. And sure, of course, we need to do that. But when it gets into more of the spiritual stuff, you know, yeah, there's a lot of deep stuff going on, and uh, let's just kind of like sit and ponder that. But. If we don't take Jesus at his word on that, or if we're not open to looking at evidence and you know get into things like, well, who is Paul? Paul is fallible. Of course he was, but the if you don't believe in the divine inspiration, the, the 
Holy Spirit giving the words of Scripture, uh, breathing into the process, and uh, dictating what, not dictating to the people what to write, but guiding their hand and, and write, you know, moving through the biblical writers in the process of writing the scriptures, then uh, you you quickly lose any kind of ability to trust in what's in the Bible, and more or less they're ne then they get to be a collection of nice teachings that have basically no weight with them, and you begin to drift into an area where well, how do you really know anything about anything because if you get into a philosophical standpoint you, where you can't trust your memory, then the only thing you can prove is really whatever you've experienced in the last maybe five minutes. And uh, you can start to question even that, where you do different thought experiments, and we're not going to get into that right now. Uh, but there's a whole can of worms there. Fair weather faith, um, it's nice when the weather's fair, right? But... When you hit something like Horatio G. Spafford did, you're like, uh, God, my my five kids uh, have died in a span of two years. Um, even though I don't understand why that happened, I am going to trust in your goodness and the fact that uh, you are faithful and you said that those who endure to the end will be the ones that receive the crown of life, that they will, they will be able to enter into your presence in eternity, and that we'll get to share in the, in the glory of your kingdom. And, uh, and there's that blessed hope that we're going to be able to see our relatives again, that the ones that, that know you, and we're going to be able to enjoy bliss in heaven with them. It's not something that you know, we're going to be sitting around strumming harps and everything for all of eternity, yes and amen. He's got stuff for us to do. There's a community that we're going to be involved in. And uh, in task, you know, there's, a, there's a purpose that he has for us on the other side of eternity. And Horatio G. Spafford, you know, as much uh, junk that was going on in his life, he didn't lose sight of that. And the third, in the third verse to his, to the song that he wrote for it is well it said, "My sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought." He just he stops in midline. Oh the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part but the whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Even in the midst of loss. He is not over the fact of salvation. He's not over the experience of salvation, of getting saved. He hasn't gotten used to or kind of, you know, gotten over getting saved yet. And it's important. Don't lose that, that joy, that, that, uh, that fire that, that, you know, oftentimes you, uh, new, a new convert to Christianity where they get into this, this, uh, kind of flame that wells up and they're like, oh, I'm going to take this world for Christ. It's like, yes. Right? And let's keep that as we move forward. Spafford did. Don't, I don't know everything that was going on in his story, to be honest with you, but you know what? He went through some awful stuff and was able to trust in the Lord anyway. And we want to say that in in the in today's world well we're we're much more enlightened we we have a lot more rational approach to things and don't really need to believe in this sort of nonsense anymore and in you know, science and logic and reason backs us up but you know what if i mean there's people who have encountered a lot less whose lives have crumbled not to make light of that but there's something this guy has that we should want and that's a steadfast relationship with the Lord and a certainty that we can plant our faith, our trust in him and not have that overturned regardless of what life throws at us. Jesus doesn't promise that nothing bad's ever going to happen, but he does promise us that when bad things come, when life throws junk our way, he's not going to let us go through it alone. 
He is going to be with us. His spirit will be with us. Spafford says, verse 4, for me, be it Christ, be it Christ, hence to live. If Jordan above me shall roll, no pain shall be mine. For in death, as in life, thou wilt whisper thy peace to my soul. It's clear where his trust was residing, where he, where he placed his trust. The Bible says where your treasure is, your heart will be there also. As precious as family is, right? And the whole blood is thicker than water, right? Family, family is precious to us. The family of Christ should be so as well. To, and to the extent that our, our biological family, our family here on earth, be they biological or not, is wrapped up in our church family that we're going to be able to, we're going to be able to meet up with after death. And Lord haste the day when the, when the faith shall be sight. When it's not just something I trust you for anymore, but, but bring the day all the more quickly when what I believe in and what I trust in you for, um, and maybe in this context, right, being able to see my kids again, being able to be with you face to face, bring that day quickly, like make that reality. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll, the trumpet shall, the trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend, even so. Right, the day of the Lord's coming, this is both an awesome day and if you're not with the Lord, a horrifying day. Even so, it's well with my soul. So, just briefly touching on, on the things that we have here. Horatio Spafford, it's, it's, it's well with my soul. Both progressive Christianity here um, in this desire to to question everything and just be okay more or less with not being able to know anything but kind of giving license to everything um, saying that we're followers of Jesus and then doubting that he did anything that sets him apart as being God, as being really anyone worth following, uh, especially if he didn't actually die for us like he said he did. He didn't rise again like he said he did. Like he said he did. He wasn't God like he said he was. Um, this is quickly becoming somebody that, if that's not true, um, I don't want to follow him. But it is true. We have evidence that it's true. We, at least at Childers refers to that. And if that's something that you guys are interested in, totally recommend you go listen to the Unbelievable podcast there. Uh, speaking, uh, uh, the Unbelievable podcast, speaking to deconstruction, doubt, and finding faith again. Um, we believe in something that's true, that's trustworthy, and that isn't just for us, but something that is meant to be shared. And I want to encourage you that Whatever is going on right now, that the Lord sees you, he's with you, and if you put your trust in him, he will steward that trust. He will not let it return void, and he'll give you the ability to say that, Lord, whatever my lot, you give me the strength to say it's well with my soul. Put your trust in him, and you won't regret it. This is... Brett with Logos Vertas, and hope you all have a good evening. Thanks.